A Coal Miner's Evidence by Charles Dickens The common scene of action for our mortal enemy death, in all his manifold shapes, whether of deep grief, slow pain, sudden terror, or prolonged and gentle decay, is upon the face and fabric of our Mother Earth. But every now and then we are startled by the intelligence of some dreadful loss of life, and loss even of numbers, from a blow dealt in the darkness of many hundred feet beneath the ground. The details of one of the last of these frightful events, together with some previous accidents of a similar kind in South Staffordshire and North Durham, we are enabled to lay before our readers in the words of a miner as related by himself. He was in the pit at the time of the recent explosion. We only omit such technical terms and local phraseology as would be unintelligible. The rest is all in his own language. I am a coal miner, as you see, and have been all my life. I was one of them as had the providential escape from the Slouton Colliery explosion, which all the newspapers, I'm told, are a-talking about just now. They may talk with good cause, but they don't know and cannot know what we suffered in our minds more than our bodies. We as survived to escape. I pray to my God night and day, and I am not much used to praying neither, that I may never again go through such a scene as that night was. Many a man prayed then, who had never thought of it much since he was by his mother's knee. Now I shall tell you what happened to us then as well as I can, for it was a dark and smoky business, you know, and not long a doing till we got walled up in the ruin, and also, if you please to hear me begin my life a bit, of some things of the same kind that have happened to me afore. These explosions are nothing new to me. I have been all my life a miner, man and boy, now these two and forty year, first at Bliston, now here in Durham. I must tell you all in my own way, from the beginning, only, as you write it down for me, just be so good as to make it all clear grammar-like in spelling, for I'm no great hand at that. I went down in the pit when I was six year old. My father and mother passed me off as seven and a half, so they got my wages. I was employed in carrying picks, little short-handled pickaxes that hew down the coals, to be mended and often carried three at a time. I got two and sixpence a week. When I was a few months older, I was put to keep a trap door. At first they let me have a candle, but after a week they said I could sit just as well in the dark to attend to the trap. I sat in a little hole like a chimney place, cut in the coal, sat in this way twelve hours a day, all in the dark. Not so very dull and lonesome as you'd suppose, a good deal of company coming and going all day. When the horse came with its empty basket and skip, he could open the door with a poke of his head. But when he came along with a load, I pulled it open by a string. He knowed all about it. I sat there with a the string in my hand. For this work I had eight pence a day. Sometime after I was moved to a trap, where I always had to pull the door open, for the horse and tram empty or loaded, and then I got ten pence a day. Besides the coming and going of the horses and men and boys, trappers have other amusement, or perhaps they might get very sad or go to sleep, and we often did, and got woke with a whip. This other amusement was often a cruel one. I was taught it by other boys. There were rats and mice in the pit, as came down in the oats and hay, and they lived by stealing the candles, horses' food, and the bait bags of the men. I sometimes killed a rat with a large coal, but when I caught mice, I used to put the tails of three or four of them into a split stick and then shake them together till they fought like mad. I always kept a bit of candle to see the sport by. Sorry I am to own it now I'm a man. There were also a great many jack gnats and wood lice and old forty legs and black clocks long-legged black beetles with horns. I was often cruel to the jacknets when they blistered me, and I used to try and make the clocks fight, but they soon shammed dead, and the old forty-legs always ran away. 
After about a year and a half in this way, I was put to sweep the tram road and clear the rail with a wisp of hay and pick up coals off the road, and next they set me to walk with a candle before horses. The candles were short sixteens. I was eight year old now and got three and sixpence a week, which I took home to my mother. Before I was nine years old, I had a bad accident from an explosion. The wildfire came running along a road and knocked itself out against the opposite end, just at the crossway where I was coming, which saved my life. But some of it reached me, and I lay ill nine weeks. It was caused by a man opening the Davy lamp to prove to another that the gas about him was not so bad as he said. They had bedded a pot of beer on it. These sorts of doings are common enough, even when you hear the gas pit pit pitting in little explosions as it gets through into the lamp. I once heard a man, one of the undergoers, who was on his way to remove a pillar, complain that his davy did not show light enough. So another man accompanied him with a lighted candle in his hand to help him see his work better. A dreadful explosion followed a few minutes after, and nine men and two boys were killed. The two underneath, where the pillar was to be hewn away, were got out all black like coke and cinder. If they hadn't been Christians, there was no call to bury them, as far as their bodies were concerned, poor fellows. Wrong, too, for they caused the death of other poor fellows by their carelessness and folly. After my accident, I did not go down again in the pit for six months. I weren't strong enough. I drove a gin in the bank. The gin consists of a horse going in a circle and working a wheel that winds up or lets down loads into the pit. The work was not hard except in cold or wet weather, but then I often stood in a hovel by a fire and kept the old horse going by pelting him with small bits of coal to let him know I was there. I learnt to read at an evening school at this time and to write a little too, but I've forgotten both since. When I next went down into the pit, I drew little wagons of coals with a girdle and chain. This is called hurrying. Hard work it was. The blisters were often as big as shillings and half-crown pieces. All full of water they were, and the blisters of one day were broken the next, and the girdle stuck to the wound. Sore work, I promise you, but I got one and sixpence a day for it, and the last three months two shillings. After this I was hired to fold to my uncle, a young fellow of nineteen, who was a putter. Those who push the little wagons of coals along the tram rods are called putters, and when a young boy helps an elder, he is called his foal. When two boys of fourteen or fifteen years of age push together equally, they are called half marrows. I was a foal for near a twelve month, and then a half marrow, and got twelve and six pence a week. One day the buddy, overseer, sent us to a part of the mine where we had never been before. There was fire damp there, and it put out our candles, one after another, as fast as we lighted them, so we saw as it was not safe to try it on any longer, and we began to scramble our way back in the dark. Laughing we were a good deal, but we missed our way and got into an old working as had been abandoned for years, and got quite lost. We wandered about here two whole days and nights before we found our way out, and were nigh starved to death. I was strong of my age, and the Betty said I had some sense in me, and set me to use the pick sooner than is usual. In general, the miner does not use the pick and become a holer or undergoer, those who go into holes and undermine masses of coal, till he is one and twenty. I was set to do this at nineteen, and earned four shillings a day, and sometimes more. Got badly burnt once at this work. I was lying in a new working where the air was bad, and I was obliged to use a davy lamp. I had bought a new watch at Tipton, and I wanted to see what o'clock it was by it, else what was the use on it. And as I couldn't tell by the davy, I just lifted off the top, and few went the gas, and scorched my face all over so that the skin all peeled off. It was shocking to see. I was laid up with this for two months, and sarved me right, I say now, but it was hard to bear at the time. As for accidents from the explosion of gas, I say there's no help for them, and never can be, so far as the men themselves are concerned. 
I have been oftentimes very careless myself, as I've told you, and so are all miners, and always will be. You may cure the mine of gas, perhaps, but you'll never cure the men. Nor I don't well see how you're to cure the gas at all times, neither. When a heading, the working at the end of an excavation, is made up a slant, the gas collects in the upper end, and to disturb this gas, as you must do, and distribute it and drive it away, ain't no safe and easy matter, without a chance of a bit of an explosion or two. The worst time of all is when an uphill heading is united to another heading, for then you're almost certain to have a rush down of the gas, and if there's an uncovered light in the way, you're sure of an explosion. Well then, don't have a light in the way. On such occasions, make the juncture of the two headings in the dark. That's a easy said, and so we are ordered, and so we ought to, but to get men to do it, that's the job. Besides, if it was all being done in the dark, a boy might come running that way with a lighted candle in his hand to sing in Susanna, and then where are you? You want to know if there's no authority and no order down in the mines, nobody to walk about and prevent accident from carelessness. Well, there's the buddy as gives out the work, and there's the doggy who is always a-walking about to see it done. But what's a man to miles and miles of darkness underground? with gas or bad air everywhere, and roof and walls always liable to fall in. The overlookers have enough to do to take care of themselves at times. Some years ago, 1838 about, at Tamworth, a buddy coming to his work in the morning walked right into the pit's mouth with two candles in his hand. And only t'other day, in one of our mines here, a doggy had his head blown off with the wildfire. It doesn't come of drink, this carelessness of the miners. It's just in our nature not to care, that's all. We do drink and eat, too, a good deal, but not in the mine. Our dinners there are not much, except on particular days, when there is a feast. But when we come up from the pit, we have hot suppers at night in our cottages. The doctors say that a miner needs to eat near three times as much as a mechanic who sits at his work all day. And we do eat three times as much. We're not a drunken set of people. Only on Mondays there's a many drunk, and not very handsome like on Tuesdays. We mostly lie in bed and sleep half Sundays. Some of us are teetotalers, but a very, very few. The Marquis of Hastings, who's a great coal owner, once told a collier that he knew a miner who had never drunk a quart of beer in all his life put together, yet he had lived to the age of ninety. But the collier said that if such a man without beer could live to be ninety, if he had but a drunk a quart of ale a day, he'd have lived forever. After I had been an undergoer three years, I had a large piece of coal fall upon me from the roof in one of the workings which broke my leg. My mother was dead, and I was not married at the time, because the girl I should have married took up with somebody else. So I went to my sister to be nursed. She and her husband were going to live at Durham and persuaded me, when I was well, to go along with them. I soon went down into the pit again and used to earn five shillings a day. It was here that happened to me one of those very bad explosions I told you of when you first spoke to me about this last business. The one I now speak of was in the Willington Colliery. It was in the Bencham seam of this colliery that the explosion I am going to tell on took place. It took place on the 19th of April, 1841, at a little arter 1 p.m. The Bencham seam lies about a hundred and forty fathoms from the surface. The coal is over four feet in thickness in most parts, and the pit is good nine feet four wide from wall to wall. The coals are drawn up in iron cages, two tubs on each cage. The pit had been in work some time. We had advanced 280 yards from the bottom of the shaft. Besides this, there were two north headways, each seven feet wide, which had advanced more than 200 yards. Holings were made between each of the headways for air. We had an upcast shaft, the Edward Pit, by which the air ascended to the surface after ventilating all the workings. The current of air, you understand, descended by another shaft, as was called the Biggie Pit, one current went one way, another current another. 
there was pains enough taken to give us wholesome air. It was at the west the explosion took place. I was at work with another man and a boy near five hundred yards reckoning ins and outs east of the shaft. A sudden rush of wind and dust came past us. It put out our candles. We knew directly there had been an explosion somewhere, and we ran along in the dark as fast as we could. We fell down several times, tumbling over stones and large pieces of coal or timber that had been shaken and blown out. When we got to the foot of the shaft, we found the iron cage stuck fast, all jammed with the explosion. But we made the signal, and another cage was lowered to us, into which we jumped, before it reached the bottom by scrambling up the sides of the shaft. When we got to the bank, and had taken our breath a bit, we saw the chief viewer of the pit come running to us with his davy lamp. We each took a davy and went down the pit to see who we could help. We knew there had been sad work among them. When we got down to the bottom of the shaft, we soon heard moans and groans. They were two lads still alive. We got them hoisted up in the cage to the bank, but they lived a very little while. Soon after we found two more quite dead, shockingly burnt. We had not gone much further when we found there had been a great fall of the roofing, and among the loose coals and stones and timbers we found a horse and a pony all mangled and singed. We now met the after damp and were thinking of returning, when a groan made us go forward, and we brought out the body of a young man alive, but in such a state he couldn't be recognized. We now found that the doors of the trappers in several places had been blown out, and consequently the air currents had ceased to ventilate all the west and north workings, so that those who were there and had escaped the explosion would be likely to lose their lives by the after damp. A strange smell of burning now made us know that some other sort of fire was at work, and as we ran in the direction it smelt like burning straw which told us it was the stables as had been taken fire. And sure enough, there they were all in thick yellow smoke and red flames. The horses were prancing wild about, and one who was blind got out and tore away and killed himself by running against a wall. We all saw death before us, if we couldn't master this fire, because if it communicated with the workings in the west and the north, where the bad gas was, there would be another blow-up, worse than the first. Mr. Johnson, the viewer, acted like a man. We all gave our minds to the work, and succeeded in stopping out with wood and wet clay plaster the entrances to these workings. Fire engines were then got down, and we continued to pump at the stables and at the walls of coal, which had took fire on each side. And after we had drenched them with water for several hours, the fire was put out. It took thirteen hours and more to do this. The main currents of air were restored as usual, and we then continued our search for those who had suffered by the explosion. We found Robert Campbell and another man crushed and buried under a fall of stone, and William Coxon and Thomas Wood and Joseph Johnson all dead, but not burnt. It seemed as if they had got to this place and then been suffocated and poisoned by the after damp. Johnson had the top of a linen cap forced into his mouth to keep out the poison, but that was no use. A little further on we found two more men, and near them three little boys, trappers they were, all burnt horrid. Some distance beyond, Thomas Bainbridge, James Lytle, and William Bower, together with two if not three more boys, who had been blown a long way, and also Robert Pearson and Richard Cooper, both very little boys, trappers, up by the north heading, we found the body of John Reed, the deputy who had charge of the pit, and also five others, some burnt, some mangled. The cause of this explosion, which cost all these lives, was traced on examination of all signs and appearances to the trapper boys Robert Pearson and Richard Cooper. Cooper's body was found away from his own trap and lying close beside that of Pearson, where we saw reasons for knowing he could not have been blown by the explosion. And all on us come to the conclusion that he had left his own trapdoor open and gone to play with Pearson. The proper course of the ventilation was thus destroyed, and when George Campbell, whose body was found near, went there with his candle to fill coals, 
the gas that had accumulated while the boys were at play instantly exploded. You are surprised that children should have charge of these air doors on which the safety of the whole mine chiefly depends, but it has always been so. They are often trappers at six years of age. I was myself. Seven and eight are the most common ages, sometimes nine. In course, the Queen's ministers don't know anything about these underground matters. Some gentlemen were sent to look after us about eight years ago. They said the Queen sent them, and they came down among us in the pits and about on the bank, but I suppose they kept what they found to themselves, for here we are with our little trapper boys and our explosions and our burnt and mangled men, just as we have always been. It's a hard life, anyway, to be killed slap-off is worst of all. Now, as to the dreadful explosion and loss of life that happened at Slouton, I thought I could tell you all about it, in some sort of order, but directly I begin to think about it. So many things come at once. It's not easy to think at all, or know what to say first. The overman had been out late on Sunday night. He went to the pit at two in the morning to see that all was safe. At three we all came to work, as a hundred and fifty of us, men and boys, went down. One of the workings was new opened, and after being closed thirteen years. A dangerous place, of course. One of the undergoers was sent in to remove the first pillar. I went to work with others at a good distance. We were at it about two hours, and then, all of a sudden, a rush of wind and coal dust cut by us, taking out all the candles, and there was a rumbling noise. We knew very well what it meant and we all ran toward the shaft. As we ran, we came upon others in the dark, and others came rushing out upon us from the side workings, and all of us together ran in a crowd and crush along the dark ways in the directions of the shaft, and presently we found those who were foremost had fallen, and we got a sudden giddiness and gasping, so we knew we had met the choke damp. It's a deathly, sleepy sickness, you feel, and sinking at the knees, only you're sure it's not the breath of sleep you're a-feeling, but you're breathing death. I called to those ahead to stop, and so did others near me, but many of them would go on, and down they went, one after the other. We felt the bad air couldn't be passed through, and we hurried backward in a worse disorder, if that's a possible, than we had come on and at last we all stopped in a scrambling crowd in a place where we found the air could be breathed. Here we remained. What a time it was, good Lord of heaven! At first the elder ones of us tried to keep some order and quiet the rest of us by telling them, as we'd knowed those on the bank, and plenty of others would be sure to know what had happened, and they'd soon come to help us. They would attend to this for a little, but soon they began to get wild and desperate, and so they went on crying out and shouting like mad, ending with a scream, until they were tired out. All this time many were down on their knees praying, and some lying about with their faces hid on the ground, and all of us expecting every minute another explosion, or else the advance of the afterdamp would bring us certain destruction. And here we remained, hemmed round by the walls and by the afterdamp, which we could no more get through than through the walls themselves. Hour after hour, every minute of which was a long torment of all sorts of things in ourselves and in all those about us. I gave myself up for lost after the first hour. Then I took hope a little, but after more time had gone I gave up hoping and was as bad as the rest. Still, as more time went on, I began to pick up a bit. I knowed our friends would help us if they could. I but could they? That was the chance. And then again I fell into despair and crouched down and covered my face and head with my hands and sat there a-trying to pray and make my last peace with God amidst all manner of cries and loud praying and miseries of despair and madness of those huddling in the darkness all round me. Sometimes they got a little silent and solemn-like and listened to the voice of one man who had never ceased to pray aloud all along. But presently somebody called out his wife's name. Two or three cried out on their children, their mothers, the girls they were to be married to, and in a moment all again was wild cries and rushing about in the dark. 
You know how we were saved. A great part of the roofing had fallen with the explosion, and this had shut off the fire from us and the advance of the after damp. Our friends made their way through the ruin, got fresh air into us, and helped us out. Some died from exhaustion when they reached the bank, but most of us recovered to thank God again and again in the arms of our wives and relations who were all standing in crowds to receive us. They had come from all parts round about. The bank was like a fair, only a different sort of merriness, and many had no cause. The grief of some was a sad sight for any man. Five and twenty had been killed, some crushed, some burnt to a black cinder, so that they couldn't be told, some torn all in pieces, their limbs being found in different places, and the head of Anderson flung into a horse tub, and the rest stamped to death. We think the explosion was caused by the gas from the old working, now opened after being closed thirteen years. Some noise made the undergoer go to this place, and instead of taking his Davy lamp, he ran there with a lighted candle in his hand. He and the man who was at work there we found near each other all black and mutilated. He was a mere body of cinder and was only known by a little book in his pocket as escaped the Queen's gentlemen when they came down here among us, said they could mend these things. But they haven't, you see. We think the Queen wasn't told. An effectual remedy for these horrible accidents is indeed most difficult to devise, for even if the government instituted a system of police inspection, it would require one officer at least to be constantly perambulating the dark roads and byways of every mine, and still, as the miner whose evidence we have just read, very truly says, an explosion might be caused by a moment's carelessness at one end of a mine while the authority was at the other. To us there appears no other chance of a remedy so good as this. First, most stringent laws as to the proper ventilation of mines. Secondly, a system of government inspection extending to that of frequent visits by day and night, at times not known to the masters or miners. And thirdly, a regular system of registration of all accidents that occur in mines, especially as regards defective machinery and the explosion of gases. This system of registration has been put in operation with respect to the factories with very good effect. No child can receive an injury which disables it from work for a fortnight without a report of the same under penalty of a heavy fine on the mill owner being sent to the inspector of the district. The publicity caused by this has brought the question so continually into notice that the force of public opinion has operated most beneficially in reducing the number of accidents. If, then, a system of inspections and registration has been found necessary with regard to works above ground, where the difficulty of concealment must be so great, how much more necessary is it in works conducted hundreds of feet or fathoms underground, where almost any recklessness or gross abuse may be committed with impunity because unknown and where none of its wrongdoings come to light except with these terrific explosions and waste of industrious human lives. End of A Coal Miner's Evidence From Household Words by Charles Dickens Recording by Joyce Martin